you guys are absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. But so it's been, uh, we've been gone five months and one week. And in that five months and one week, we actually met Father's Day. And since they've been gone, you know, you all look so wonderful, especially some of you look so much better with a mask. Just like, you know, I'll just, just say it. And you know who you are. You're in my Thursday morning groups. So, uh, but, uh, and some of you see me with a, a big uh, uh, sling on today. I've had that, I had rotator cuff surgery three weeks ago. And I'm allowed to take that off just for preaching. And who allowed that? Dr. Bauckham. Wrote me a prescription. <laughs> as long as I don't fall, I'm okay. So I have to be very careful. And, this, uh, and some of you know, two years ago, I had the same surgery. And, and say, so why did you have it done? Well, this shoulder was jealous of this shoulder. And, you know, so, the, but the surgery's good. So welcome back. It's been five months out of the building. And the new, the new normal, which things change, don't they? And the thing, there's a, there's a beatitude that I wrote many years ago, blessed are the flexible. And we want to be flexible. But, you know, masks, sanitizer, you know, we ask you to minimize contact. I've given you a lot of fist bumps. And it's really hard because I'm such a hugger. You know, we have fresh air vents in this building. I want to describe those to you. Those vents are the size of a hula hoop. And there are four of them just in this room. And they're throughout the entire building. So as I'm talking, fresh air is being pumped in here. So we're not just recycling the old stuff. But, uh, and, uh, th- but thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your, your continued giving. You know, for the five months that we've been off, the, f- the staff has been paid. And I uh, appreciate that. Full-time staff, even part-time staff a lot. And that's because of your faithfulness. So thank you for that. So, but today, as, as grateful as I am, I'm so delighted to be here in community. Because we go by our middle name at Suncoast. Suncoast Community Church, and we are about community, and thank you so much for being here. We're in the series called The The Right Thing. We've been looking at this for several weeks, and in this series, we're looking at how our lives are comprised of thousands of decisions, 200 decisions a day just on what you're going to eat. Now, me, that's not a problem. I just, you know, I ate two masks this week. I mean, it just seems like the quarantine, just keep eating is not a problem. But, but here's the question I want us to focus on, and I think it's a very practical teaching for us. How do we make sure we make the right decisions? The first week, we looked at the teachings of Jesus, how he went into the, in the wilderness, and he was so challenged by the decisions that he had to make. And here was the primary decision. Will you use your power to turn stones to bread? Will you use your power for solely individual self-gratification, and he said no. In this series, we've discussed the many decisions that we, we make every day and the need to make the right decisions. We suggested that we look inside our hearts, see who we are. We discussed those things that make our hearts sing. We talked about soul minimalist. What does that mean? It's simply regularly flushing out those things that consume us. And one of the quotes from one of those teachings back on, when what we owns, owns us, there's a problem. And I talked about a swing set. Years ago, my in-laws bought a swing set for my kids, and it took me a day and a half to put the stupid thing together. (laughs) It's just a curse. If you ever put a swing set together, you know. The only thing worse than this metal one is a wood one, I put two of those together. I forbid my wife to buy anything that has to be assembled, (laughs) unless she's willing to assemble it, and she does. And it's a great combination. But when I put that swing set together, I read the fine print, and this is what it said. Every 30 days from now on, you need to tighten every nut and bolt on this swing set or it'll eat your children alive. (laughs) Right? I mean, it's just forever. So when what you own owns you, it's a problem. And you think, well, what, what do you have that you spend all your time? What possession do you have you spend all your time taking care of those things? We need to think about that. We talked one week about name it. We looked at the Bible where Jesus calmed Mary by saying, her, excuse me, Martha, by saying, Martha, Martha, calm down. He changed Simon Peter's name. You, you were called this, now you're going to be called the rock. He shouted Lazarus' name when Lazarus was in the tomb. He said Mary's name after the resurrection. When we name that which is affecting us, bothering us, frightening us, concerning us, when we identify it, then we can deal with it appropriately. So that was the week, name it, and the next week was claim, oh, it's frame it, not claim it. And frame it simply says that our frame makes sense to everything. Do you know the context of what's going on in our life changes the decisions that we make? For example, remember this, I told the story of the brand new lumpy sofa in San Francisco. Somebody bought a sofa, brand new, wonderful. It was lumpy. 
they, they'd sm smooth the lumps out and then move to the other side. Smooth the lumps out and the next day would be over here. Finally, they called the, the, um, um, the company that sold them this new sofa. They came out to check it out and it had a python inside the sofa. Think about that when you go to rooms to go. Right? I mean, you just don't know, or, or bears, I should say. But when you go there, so when you frame it, it brings understanding. And to view the Bible within its frame, within its context, is critical for us to understand it. Because what the frame was in the first century is not the same frame in the 21st century. And if you read it without the frame, you really can misunderstand it, and a lot of people do. And they misinterpret it, and they make it say what was never intended to say. A healthy view of God frames our understanding of life. Our context or our view of God affects the decisions that we make. When we blame God or we credit him for the consequences of our lives. When our frame is fear, we make decisions based out of fear. But I, I believe it's important that our healthy view of God drives the next right thing. In addition, not just the Bible, not just a view of God, our culture changes the way we think. Who would have thought a year ago, 2019, that we would, the next year we'd be five months shut down and come back wearing masks? No, it was not in my, con it was not in my brain at all. But this is the year that it's gonna go down in history. 2020, the year of the coronavirus, the year of quarantine, businesses shut down, schools and churches shut down, the year of the mask controversies. So let me talk about mask controversies. If you really think masks are stupid, and some of you do, some of us do, or if you really think masks are totally essential, and some of us think that they're totally essential, whether you're on the one side of that or the other, take a deep breath and be kind to people, right? You've seen the things where people are screaming at each other. It's just not the way we should act. It's not part of who our heart is. 2020, the year of the coronavirus, the shuts down, shut down, the year of the protests, the riots. You know, our culture frames our decisions. And in this series, our challenge is always to live in the present to do the next right thing. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about this. Am I, am I being led by love or pushed by fear? Too often, our decisions are fear-based. And then last week, if you didn't watch this online, we looked at three healthy lists. To make good decisions, let's make lists. There's a to-do list. Then there's a pro-con list, and there's a life energy list. The to-do list simply is, what are the six most important things you need to do today? Those six things, and do those. And if you get to the end of the day, and, and you only do two or three of those, at least you've done the most important thing first. Then there's the, the pro-con list. A list of 20 reasons why you should do something. These are the reasons I should. These are the reasons I shouldn't. And no, there's 20 on the to-do side. And if you say, well, because there's 20, there's only two that I shouldn't, then I should vote for the 20. That's a flaw. Anybody that does a pro-con list and does that, you need to understand not everything is evenly weighted. For example, if I do this, I'm going to make more money. I'm going to be more prosperous. I'm going to have a nicer house. I'm going to, I'm going to you know, uh, be able to have the car I always wanted. And you go through all the list of all the positives. And the negative on this side is you're going to die in one week. Or it's going to kill you. Are you going to lose your family? Or, you know, all the, so sometimes, trust me, money, possessions on this side is all good, but on this side, if it's pain and death, I tell you, those things are not evenly weighted. And then the life energy list simply states this, that I need to do those things more that pour energy into my life and do things less that drain my life away. So today we're in a new talk, and, and I hope this resonates with you. In Ecclesiastes, the writer of the Ecclesiastes says it this way. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. There's a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot. There's a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build. A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. There's a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search, a time to give up. A time to keep, a time to throw away. A time to, to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent, a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. 
This is the great wisdom literature in the Bible. There's a time for all these things. So here's my question to you. What time is today for you? And really, it's about your context. Because for me, I had surgery. It's a time, there's a time to have surgery and there's a time to mend. A time to tear the rotator cuff, a time for it to, and I'm in the mending side. But I, but I want, what, what time is it for you? Your context determines that. So let me give you three thoughts today. They're in your notes. Here's the first one. Never enough is always a statement, is a statement of always chasing more. There's a story of a couple who were at Hilton Head, South Carolina. They'd been there many times on vacation, and, and as they were there, they saw this yacht come in. And as it came in, it was the biggest yacht that either one of them had ever seen. It was massive. It was beautiful. And, when, and as it came in, they looked at it, and, and uh, they you know, didn't want to give it too much attention, but they just couldn't help it. It was just spectacular. There were people on board, and they were laughing and having fun, and they were in black you know, a white tie event, a black tie event, and these long jackets and people were serving them the hors d'oeuvres and the drinks and their laughter was there. And as it went through, everybody watching it thought, boy, that would, you could see their mind think, man, it'd be great. It'd be great to be on something like that. Wouldn't it be great to live that kind of life? And as it pulled away, they looked at the back of it and the name of the yacht was Never Enough. And enormous and glamorous as this yacht seemed to be, there always will be a yacht that's bigger. Many people look on a yacht like that with envy. But I want to suggest to you, it does not take a yacht to give you a full life. Maybe, maybe, people look at your life and they see how wonderful it is. You want to have a full life? Don't look at what you don't have or it's never enough. Count your blessings. Begin to list all the things for which you're grateful Be content with the material things and strive for those things that bring lasting joy. And here's a key question. Rather than chasing more or never enough, what if we can discover enough right where we are today? It'll change your life. You know, do do you have enough? I see family members, friends who live on a fraction of what I live on. And they live fine and they live happy lives. It's not about what I own that makes a difference. It's about my internal compass of which direction I'm headed and what is fulfilling to me. You know, there, you know there's some important decisions to, to consider when making life decisions. Is it really what I want? Good question. Another question is, is it what I have been taught to think that I want? Maybe what you really need is this, but what you've been taught to think is never enough. Have you ever spent a lot of time and energy on something and then let it go? Boy, I have. Dreams are wonderful things. You get a big dream, and most of us, we see something, we're passionate about it, we achieve that dream. Dreams are wonderful things, but listen carefully. Dreams change. And just because things change doesn't mean that you chose wrongly in the first place. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean that you have to do it forever. For example, those of you in sales or nursing, maybe a firefighter, police officer or doctor, a business owner, just because you do it well doesn't mean you have to do it forever. Major League Baseball players and football, NFL, they have a certain shelf life, usually to about their mid-30s. There's a few that the Tom Brady's who make it their 40s, but just a few. But, but then once you're really good at something and it, and it ends, what then? Things change. I remember a friend of mine who was part of this congregation, he had a beautiful boat. It was his dream. When, one day I went to talk to him about his boat and it was just set up exactly the way he wanted. He was moving from Sarasota out of town to another place up north. And I said, but what about your dream? This has always been your dream. And he said these words to me, he said, dreams change. It's true, isn't it? I mean, dreams change. Some dream of future occupations only to change their mind. Some get college degrees to discover even though you have a degree in something, it's not what you want to do. Some dream of affluence and more, and things are never enough. That's their dream. But what is it that happens that changes our dreams? 
Let's go back to the Bible. Peter and John were fishermen. Jesus came along and they left the comforts of what they'd always done and they changed their vocation from fishing for fish to fishing for men. In Acts, there's a story of Paul of Tarsus who was on the road to Damascus one day persecuting those of the way, the Christians, and, and a lightning hit him or something who struck down with a bright light and he was kind of in a trance and he had a vision and Jesus came to him and said, why are you persecuting me? And on that day, he went to Damascus and he was blind, but his eyes were open and he changed his career, not from persecuting the way to supporting that. What is it that changes our life direction? What is it that changes our heart? Many things, but for me, I look back and the primary thing that has changed my life more than anything is Jesus Christ. Folks, I'm a follower of Jesus. I believe the life he lived showed me lessons of how to be selfless. And it's about how to get away from those things that oppress other people. And that never enough is not really my life's goal. But Jesus, how do I dream the right dream for my life? Well, the answer is really in the second truth we look at today. It's this. Slow down and live life without all the clutter. I would suggest you discover something called essentialism. What is essentialism? It's not how to get more things done, but how to get the right things done. What is essential that I'm missing? Sort of like the to-do list that we talked about a week or so ago with this caveat. What is the most important thing for me to do today? I talked to my men's group on Thursday morning. There's a bunch of guys that meet at 6.30 in the activity center. And if you guys, if you're interested in that kind of meeting, it's, it's available for you. But there's about a dozen guys that gather this week. And I asked last week and this week, what if you only had one hour today? One hour today to get all your work done. What would you do? We surely would look through and say, what is the most important thing? I, I heard this week from a, through a text message that a good friend of mine has pancreatic cancer. And I go, boy, life gets, takes a different dimension when you're here, you have pancreatic cancer. A successful businessman. What do you do when you say, my life has, the window is closing and the days now are less. I need to make sure I get the most important things done. No one that I've ever heard of said, you know, on their deathbed, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. Right? No one. Now, I've heard people say, you know, I wish I'd spent more time listening to you, Pastor Larry. Yeah. Okay, I just made that up. I never heard that either. No, just, just this group. And that's dysfunctional. But anyways. We'll take, that too. take that too, fair enough. But maybe if we have 12 hours a day, we don't get what we need to do done. But if we have one hour, we get the most important thing done. So I've discovered this thing in my life a years ago. It's called a dog day, D-A-W-G. What is a D-A-W-G? Day alone with God. I go out and spend some time with him. I only take some paper, maybe a notebook, no phone, just my thoughts in God. You know what it does? It helps me see where the trajectory of my life. It helps me evaluate to know where I'm headed and I want to make sure that what's essential in my life is not pushed to the bottom of my to-do list. Maybe what's essential, maybe I think, well, is it a degree? Is it another degree? Folks, I have more degrees than a thermometer. It's not about, that's good. It's not about degrees. I tell you, I love this front row. Anyways, maybe what's essential in your life you think is a six or seven figure income. Or maybe what you think in your life is, I just need somebody to spend my life with. I'm, I'm lonely. I need a life partner. But if we're so busy that we're blind to what is important, we will never discover what is essential. If you get up every day and you go from daylight till dark and you collapse because you're exhausted and you never have a chance to reflect on where you're going with your life, you probably will not accomplish the most important things in your life. Begin to see the most important things. Spend your time and work in that area which leads to the last truth today. Consider quitting something that does not reflect your dreams or your heart. What is that? It's not church. We tried that for five months. So what would that be? We'll need to let some things go. Sometimes it takes, that has to be done in stages or steps. For example, in 1997, 
after a year of intense devotion and a lot of day, days along with God, I began to evaluate my life through a new lens. In 1998, I quit my career. Now, folks, after four years of college, four years of graduate school, and seven years in a Ph.D. program, pastoring for 17 years, since I was in high school, I wanted to be a pastor. And then all of a sudden, one day, I just said, I quit. I don't want to do this anymore. It was no longer my priority. Why? Because my dreams changed. They shifted. Step one was a realization. Step two, I moved into a different role altogether. I quit pastoring. I moved into sales. I worked with people, which I like. I made plenty of money, which I like. But I will tell you, it did not make my heart sing. Step three, I started dreaming of starting a brand new church. Step four, I quit my sales job and move from Tallahassee back to Sarasota. And I will listen very carefully. Being the pastor of Suncoast has made my heart sing more than anything that I know, more than any degree. Now, my relationship with Christ, my wonderful wife of 44 years, all my children, my grandchildren, and Suncoast, those are the things that make my heart sing more than others. So here's some questions to help us focus. Something you can ask yourself. Am I working hard towards something only to realize it isn't right anymore? We do that. We work very hard. All of a sudden, hey, this is just not right anymore. I need to change. Has my heart changed on an issue, but my mind has not yet got the memo? Sometimes that happens. When I'm doing, what I'm doing takes up my time, but it doesn't add value to my life. So let me suggest some time burners, some things that you might suggest quitting. <laughs> You're not going to like this, but that's okay. Facebook, okay? You want to waste your time? Spend it on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Now, for those of you who are not so social media driven, the news. I mean, how many hours a day can you watch the news? I have watched a lot of news. Just recently, I canceled my Facebook. I said, I don't want to be caught up in it. I don't, I'm not on those things. Why? Because I want to spend my time on more valuable things. I spend time in reflection. Spend time wondering how valuable you are to God and others. Dream of what's most important in your life. Wouldn't it be great if you walked out of here today with this just this simple thing? I'm going to add value to my life by making sure I do the most important things and quit some of the nonsense that gives me anxiety and frustration, and fear. Can I pray for you? Father, may the uncertainties and questions of life pave my way to you. Help me to know when to say yes, when to say no. Help me to know and do the next right thing. We pray in the spirit of Christ. Amen. Would you stand, please? I'm going to tell you a story in closing. Boy, do you know Becky and I have five grandchildren. We are so blessed. To be a part of this community is a blessing. But you know, the five grandchildren, we're blessed that they all live here. They're all going to be in Sun Coast, even they're all here today. I mean, they, they live here. London, who just turned five last month, she's our youngest grandchild. She's Lauren Ricardo who's on the stage. She's their, their second daughter. But Becky, they come to the house, and they swim, and they spend a lot of time at Grandma and Pop's house. And as she was leaving to go out to her car, we, so they go through the utility room and walk down two steps in the garage and out the door to their car. And there's a big mirror about this tall at the door that Becky put there so you, know, you can check everything before you go out, make sure you got, you know, things in order. And she stops by the mirror at, before she goes out. She's by herself and she looks at the mirror. <laughs> and I'm, I'm observing. What does a five-year-old do? And this is, as she looked at herself, she said out loud, my face is so cute. <laughs> now she's five. Now why would she say that? Because she's heard it many, many times. So today, I want you to stop by the mirror on your way out and repeat what you've heard many times before. God really does love me. And so does my pastor. God bless. Thanks for being here. Yeah.